Um, in, in 2005, the island nation of Antigua finally got a result out of the WTO. It brought a claim against the United States of America uh, with respect to internet gambling. It's a, it's a tiny island nation with, with 90,000 people, less now. Um, and they were trying to overcome the fact that they're, they're, they were competing poorly in the tourist economy. Their agriculture had been wiped out by a series of hurricanes. They needed to diversify. Um, they had a good education system. And so they tried to come up with a high-tech strategy for getting a, a corner of the gambling market. And so they used internet gambling as a platform to do that uh, so that they didn't have to attract people to the island to gamble at casinos, but rather they could essentially export the services. Um, their strategy was working. They were gaining market share. The size of the gambling market, the internet gambling market in the United States uh, at the time was approaching $4 billion, and it's projected in the next year, 10 years to exceed $20 billion. Um, in response to the growing market share in internet gambling, the U.S. Justice Department and state attorneys general collaborated to essentially enforce a variety of federal and state laws that ban internet gambling uh, through a, a number of mechanisms. This basically shut down the industry to a great extent in Antigua. So frustrated that they, that they were essentially blocked at the border, in a figurative sense, they brought a claim in the WTO. Uh, if you will, it's uh, a bit of a David versus Goliath story, and a lot of people just didn't give their case much credence. Um, in a nutshell, what happened in the decision announced in the spring of 2005 was that uh, the WTO said, yes, these state and federal measures with respect to gambling um, do violate WTO rules called market access rules. These are part of the, the GATS, the General Agreement on Trade and Services. However, the WTO concluded that there was a general exception in the GATS um, with respect to public morals and that the United States had persuaded the WTO that it should apply in the case of Internet gambling specifically. Um, with one important exception. Uh, because the United States allows, through federal law and state participation, remote gambling for, for um, horse racing, that the United States couldn't defend that on the grounds of public morals since it allows by law remote gambling for horse racing. <clears throat> That's a problem that still has to be fixed. The United States has promised the WTO will fix the problem, but it'll take congressional legislation to do so. And if Congress does that, that would mean no more remote betting on horse racing. And the industry is, as you can imagine, concerned about their future. So <clears throat> what did the United States win exactly? Well, it, it won the conclusion by the WTO that the public morals exception will work in the case of internet gambling, but the same logic that applies to, say, access to minors or addictive behavior related to easy access to your home computer uh, does not necessarily apply with respect to casinos. Um, nor can the United States use a public morals argument with respect to regulated casino gambling or lotteries or slots when 48 states license it and tax the hell out of it, and only two states say they have public morals concerns, that would be Utah and Hawaii. So if anyone ever uses this WTO uh, logic uh, to challenge the rest of the gambling regulatory structure in the future, this WTO case gives you no comfort. So what Antigua established was that the United States had made a trade commitment on gambling services. The WTO said it understood that that commitment was a result of a mistake, that the United States did not intend to make the commitment. It was apparent to everyone that that mistake would have never have been made had the trade negotiators talked to state and local regulators about the scope of, quote, other recreation services, which is what they were negotiating back in 1993 and 1994. <clears throat> and that now all gambling laws are covered, including land-based, or if you will, terrestrial gambling, and uh, state laws are covered. So this case is interesting. It tells us a lot about the context for future WTO litigation on this case, perhaps. For a number of aspects of the case that the WTO basically dismissed for lack of a good pleading, uh, the WTO appellate body gave Antigua a, a manual on how to refile the case and make their arguments effectively. So the case is still open to that extent, beginning with a horse racing issue. So in the future, could a little country like Antigua really hit the United States, the Goliath, in a trade dispute like this? Many people say that even if they had won, it would have made no difference because the concept of trade sanctions, given how much trade Antigua does with the United States, is, is minuscule, it, it not hardly even measurable in uh, macroeconomic terms. Let me give you two reasons why we ought to all give some pause. And but think, it does open the door. Well, it opens the doors in two ways. One was Antigua, which is not too far from Brazil, 
was prepared to use Brazil's recommended strategy for applying sanctions to the United States. Brazil, by the way, is about to do so in a case they won with respect to upland cotton. <clears throat> um, and that would be to apply sanctions not to the gambling industry, but to intellectual property, and to expropriate patents, essentially, for example, pharmaceutical patents, or uh, software or industrial designs. Um, and imagine the shock and amazement of the industry that might be affected, not the gambling industry, but the, the drug industry and pharma. So essentially Antigua, like Brazil, could pick out the most powerful lobby in Congress if they wanted to and figure out how to apply a trade sanction to that that would cause economic pain to that lobby in Congress. Let me ask you this. Would, does pharma participate in the <clears throat> WTO discussions more than legislators? Oh my goodness, yes. <laughs> yes. I don't think they've been <clears throat> given diplomatic status yet, but they, <laughs> they're there. The word, well, I mean, but they participate. They're more visual and more active in the discussions than legislators that have been elected to represent right. the people. But I think you can take heart that an experienced person who used to be a lobbyist for pharma is now the liaison between USTR and state and local government, so you can get the benefit of that deep experience. <laughs> but that is in just this one particular, yes. <laughs> I think we know who you're speaking of, but that is in just that one particular industry. And no. But we have others where we don't have that expertise. No, but, but it's not, let it be not lost that pharma is on the cutting edge of intellectual property, uh, which is the cutting edge of growth in the United States economy. So give pharma its due. It's it's no. the growth engine for the United States, and so they're in the heart of USTR's strategic vision. Okay. Very much so. Um, now we're left with a problem using this gambling case as uh, a way to understand the significance of GATS. Still, it's just a little country. Maybe, maybe they would have the authority to pick maybe one patent to steal uh, as a function of their trade sanctions. But here's the thing. If Antigua can prove a claim on any aspect of Internet gambling, or any other aspect of gambling, if Antigua says, well, you beat us here, so we're just going to invest the remaining capital we have in a casino in California. Oops, you tell us we can't get a license because only tribes have monopolies for this kind of license? Ha <laughs> ha, WTO claim on grounds of discrimination. So I think they have a very interesting strategy, and the only thing we have to figure out now is what about being small? And my point is that if one country can demonstrate the claim and win the sanction, what keeps all the other countries from piling on? And so, if you look at the handout that I prepared, which would have been a powerful light show and now is reduced to these pitiful little pieces of paper, um, look on page two where you'll see box number four. If you could find that. There are 2,100 internet gambling sites, or there were last year in the English language, 1,300 of which are licensed by governments. And out of the top five or six jurisdictions of licensed internet gambling, of course, you see Antigua right at the top. Costa Rica and Canada follow right beneath, both of which are part of free trade agreements with the United States, which have investment provisions, allowing invest private investors to bring a claim, uh, like perhaps uh, uh, others have in the context of the Methanex case or the Glamis case. And then you see the United Kingdom, and I wanted to call your attention to the fact that the United Kingdom began licensing internet gambling sites only after this case was begun. Really? And so now it has positioned itself to take advantage of whatever legal gains Antigua makes, bringing the European Commission along with them, with the argument being that if the UK and the European Commission can recognize a way to regulate internet gambling on a multinational way, level, that becomes the international standard, and how can you say that the United States must find it necessary to ban internet gambling in order to overcome its concerns about public morals? And I'll come back to that comparison between the fact that the UK is now licensed based on a, a scheme that could be applied multinationally. So that's the story. It gives